Director Geary is elsewhere. We'll give her an opportunity to add comments. Director Blanford, your comments, please. Thank you. Um, much emptier room. I, I should have uh, tried to make my remarks before the break. Um, I also want to thank Dega Moomin for uh, being on the dais today. I think she added uh, a great tone to the conversation. We always love to hear what our uh, students have to say. And congratulations to whomever was responsible for um, asking Noah Purcell to present to our vac uh, valedictorians. I thought that was a um, incredibly thoughtful uh, idea and obviously he's kind of a superstar these days so it was nice to um, see a Seattle Schools product going to such great things and I expect that our valedictorians and the other students who were recognized this evening will uh, go on to similar great accomplishments in their lives. Um, I also want to thank the Shoreline or Shore South Shore it's getting late. South Shore K-8 students who performed for us today, they did a fabulous job and again that was a um, warm presentation that uh, warmed all of our hearts. Uh, our partners, the Seattle Housing Authority and um, also the recognition that our school nurses, our nationally board certified school nurses received. Um, they do fabulous work and I'm glad that we have the opportunity to uh, recognize that work. Um, as has been shared before, I was blessed to have the opportunity to uh, give some remarks at the Naramore Art Show uh, a week and a half ago and um, it was truly an honor to, to get the chance to one, see the fabulous artwork that our students have created and two, to uh, participate in recognizing them. Um, a big shout out needs to go out to Gail Sailhorst, who was the organizer of that event for uh, putting together a fabulous event at the Seattle Art Museum. Um, I also want to recognize the folks who presented from Denny Middle School. Um, Jeff Clark has been an outstanding principal in our district for a long time and I heard him speak about the instructional leadership that happens at that school, the collaborations and relationships and the standards-based grading that are all best practices on both um, closing achievement and opportunity gaps as well as improving instruction for all students. And so it's a great opportunity for us to hear from one of our acknowledged leaders uh, around uh, what they're doing at school and hopefully it can be replicated more widely to the other schools in the district. And um, I also want to appreciate, though there are not very many of them in the audience anymore, those who presented to us today on the issues that they care about. Um, I've been a school board director long enough now to know that um, many of these issues are interrelated and all come from one source. And that is the fact that we uh, are struggling with a $50 million budget deficit and there's just not enough money in our system. Um, it is, in some ways, it's bittersweet to hear the, um, the presentations and the uh, performances of our students on one hand and then to see schools fighting against one another, though it's not you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat or anything. In many cases, many of the arguments that have been made um, in order for us to actually give to the uh, presenters what they want, we would potentially have to take from other students. And that's not something that anyone uh, looks at lightly and does without a lot of regard. We, as uh, elected officials and school board directors, you know, have to run for office by reaching out to people across the city and we get to know uh, school communities and individuals who care very deeply about their children and we want to honor that care and concern and so it's difficult to be in a place where we would have to pit one school against another and we're looking for solutions that are bigger and bolder than that and so I hope those who are um, those who presented today and those who are listening um, can work with us to generate those types of um, positive outcomes that will work to the benefit of all of our kids. Um, I also would like to thank 
Director Gary for a phone call that she made to me a couple weeks ago where she informed me that um, the, the outwardly facing um, public disclosure commi committee has uh, somehow misplaced a document that I submitted and um, has me showing to the public that I'm running for office again in 2017. I've made the determination that I am not running again and it is very difficult to recruit uh, folks to run for District 5, the seat that I've represented, when it, it is perceived uh, that there's an incumbent in the race. And so, um, though I don't like to do too much campaigning or anything along those lines, I think it's important to share with those who are listening tonight that uh, the District 5 seat is wide open and available for uh, anyone who is considering. The deadline is Friday at 4 o'clock, I believe, and um, it is easy to go to the um, King County Elections website if you are interested in uh, trying to trying to replace me is probably not the right way of saying it, but interested in serving in my position after I leave. Also, you can also uh, file to run for District 4 or District 7 positions, which are also going to be on the ballot in uh, 2017. And then finally, um, I recently got a document that um, I guess some, some of the folks that are working on the remodel of Meany Junior High School, Meany Middle School, um, found as they were doing some construction, it was a time capsule document that um, was put in a time capsule back on June the 4th, 1963. Um, and they shared it with me because Meany is in the district that I represent. Um, and it, it was a fascinating document. Now I'm going to read part of it if I have the chance here. It is from C.S. Barbo, who was the principal of Meany Junior High School at the time. And he had been a principal from September of 1959 to the date that he wrote this in June of 1963. He wrote, many changes have transpired since I came to Meany Junior High School. At that time, we were located mostly in an old wooden Longfellow structure. Now we're moving into a completely new and remodeled plant. Many changes have evolved in our curriculum. At the present time, we're working towards an improved program for what is called the disadvantaged students. This means a larger staff so that classes of 20 or less can be maintained for slow learning students. Um, these slow learning students are, and he uses a term that I'm not willing to use, these slow learning students are blank because of cultural, racial, and economic disadvantages. If this box is ever opened, I would assume that the problems which we face today in understanding the racial differences will have been resolved. Personally, I trust that this will happen. Signed, C.S. Barbo, Principal, um, Meany Middle School, in June of 1963. When I read that, it almost brought me to tears thinking about um, what they were dealing with in 1963, and that was you know, at the height of the Civil Rights Movement, the demographics of that neighborhood, which I live not very far from, uh, were radically different than they are. And in that time, they were talking about many of the same issues that we are still talking about uh, 54 years later. And, and I think that's important because those issues don't go away. They manifest in different ways, and we have to redouble and triple our efforts to stay on top of them and to recognize that, that we have the power to uh, change the trajectories of many students um, through our focus on equitable outcomes for all of our students. And so my hope is that um, in the time that I have left on the board, in the time that we all are working on the board, and with the staff that we have, that we redouble and triple our efforts to address the economic, racial, 
and ethnic achievement and opportunity gaps that our community demands for us, demands that that's what we should be focused on. I hope that um, in 2018, 2019, we make substantive progress so that um, a time capsule that's open 50 years from now um, actually can celebrate, can, we can look at it and celebrate the progress that we've made. So thank you. Part two, I uh, understand you have some additional comments, and Director Gary, if you weren't finished when we changed the tape, you're welcome <laughs> to add to yours as well. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to uh, continue my list. Uh, congratulations to our top honor students uh, who we uh, have honored here today, and also it's a great honor to have Nora Purcell as the person, the speaker for to encourage these students I've had the privilege to actually to be with Noah Purcell uh, when Franklin um, actually awarded him a award, and um, and it was actually kind of really it was an advantage and also for she to be able to uh, accept the same award with him at that particular day. So it's great to see him again, and uh, it's always wonderful to have uh, people such as Noah Purcell to be part of our uh, presentations here at the Seattle School District. Thank you to South Shore for their amazing performance. The kids did a wonderful job. Um, and as uh, Director Geary was saying, uh, one of our students actually that was on the side there really quietly, and then all of a sudden, he just became alive. And I mean, it was just amazing the different things that he did. And so that was a great performance. Thank you for the teachers that actually work with these students and bringing them here so we can actually be able to enjoy their performance. Thank you to Danny Middle School for a great presentation. Um, continue on the success and the great work that you're doing. Uh, and also congratulations to all our students who were, um, who were actually um, all here tonight to speak their mind and be able to tell us exactly what is it that they would like us to do. Um, I think it's great that we continue to see more and more of our students come out here and share their opinion with us on many of our meetings and it, it's, it's just a really a great opportunity to see all these kids come out and be able to uh, talk about what is it that we need to do or how can we actually be able to make Seattle schools a better place for all our kids. Uh, advanced um, learners, I guess my question is how many students of color have we recruited at this point? I know we met not too long ago about uh, what do we need to do to actually to encourage more kids of color into the advanced learning program and hopefully to change some of the ways that we are able to qualify kids to be able to be part of uh, advanced learning. So hopefully that um, I can be able to see some of those changes take place uh, within as the, the year goes. And then um, I wanted to say that my community meeting will actually be on May 27th. And it's from uh, 10 to 12 o'clock, and it's at Rock on Tour at Seward Park. Gary, if you've got additional comments, please feel free. Only wanted to clarify that my coffee tomorrow is from 7.30 to 9 at Soka on Blakely, and my meeting is on May 30th from 6 to 7.30 p.m at the Northeast Branch Library, and I believe that's a Tuesday night, so not a weekend like they often are. But I was speaking so quickly that I may have jumbled it up. Thank you. Okay, I guess I'm next up. Um, again, $64.3 million and $100,000 a day fines by the Washington State Supreme Court to the Washington State Legislature. I like a pregnant pause over that because that's an extraordinary number. And as my colleagues have said far more eloquently than I can, the problems that we heard testimony about tonight are directly related to the lack of funding and I personally believe new revenue sources by our friends in Olympia. And, and, and it's going way too slow, and we're going to have a second special session, and we need to stand up and get counted along with our labor partners who have done an extraordinary job in the last couple of weeks 
they have had a rotating crew of folks in the Capitol tagging every legislator that walks by and telling their stories. And, and it's a big lift. And these are people that are taking their personal <coughs> vacation time to do it. So I say thank you, especially to SCA. Michael Tomeo, the Vice President of SCA, thank you. Thank Phyllis as well. It's not okay. And you know, it's not just school board positions that folks are filing for before 4 o'clock on Friday. <coughs> We've got some races out there that would change the balance of power in Olympia. So, like they say, in your community, it's time to walk your talk. And walking your talk probably means knocking on doors. I hope so, anyway. Um, Noah Purcell, what a hero. But I have to tell you that Rick Nagel, his teacher, at Franklin of many, many years is responsible for launching an enormous um, group of very talented lawyers, many judges, I believe a couple of justices in there, as well as former Governor Gary Locke. So uh, he's, he's got a rock star farm team, I guess is how you say it. And when you think about the difference a teacher can make, it's humbling. And it's profound. Nurses, um, I almost felt like we should have drugged Peggy McAvoy up here, our assistant superintendent, because she started her career as a nurse. And, uh, and she's proud of it, as well she should be. Thank you, Peggy. Um, SHA, a couple of things that came to mind with SHA when they were presenting. There was an SHA property, the Benbow Apartments, that burned this last year. And I am so proud to report to you that our community engagement director, Carrie Campbell, wave please, thank you, got on the phone at 11.30 at night, worked with her partners at SHA. They triangulated and dragnetted other folks into this as well as school principals of six schools, I believe, with the children living in the SHA Benbow Apartments and made sure folks had a place to sleep, made sure that they were being fed, and it was one of the most beautiful demonstrations of, of cooperation and, and leveraging off of each folk. I, I just, I needed to share that with you. I, I know some of those kids in that apartment, and a um, couple of them very, very closely. Former boyfriend of the daughter, she'll kill me for that. Um, but we really did ourselves proud and, and made a difference. And it has been condemned, so that means that a number of families have had to move and live elsewhere. And we all know the price of uh, admission in Seattle real estate and, and what an extraordinary um, job that SHA has with respect to homelessness and, and our 3,000 homeless kids that they're helping and keeping their eyes on as well as we are. The other is, is that out at Sandpoint, SHA worked really closely with princip then principal, planning principal, Dee Dee Fauntleroy, um, with respect to opening up Cedar Park Options School, which hugely appreciated. Again, um, that collaboration leverages us and just makes us a whole lot stronger. Uh, the scholarship event last Thursday was, this room was packed, and it was just the most extraordinary, coolest thing you've ever seen. Uh, we'll have photographs up soon. And thank you to Michael Tolley, who spent time upstairs looking for video cameras. God bless you. That was funnier than heck. And then we realized, both Michael and I, oh, hello. We don't need a video camera. We're old school. Let's use the iPads that are in our hands. It was, it was hysterically funny, but I really appreciate your willingness. Um, <laughs> and then Kerry Campbell says on the phone, Leslie, this is like working in a nonprofit again. And I said to her on the phone, I said, darling, what are you talking about? <laughs> if we're not the original nonprofit, tell me what is. It was, it, it had such a joy 
to this event and every one of the recipients and their counselors had a bond. It, it, made, it made a great many folks cry and rightly so. Denny Middle School, <coughs> International Middle School, District 6, four blocks from the house, maybe three. Um, what a team that they have established out there. And they've done extraordinary things and then I get excited about how they have defined new practices that we can use to replicate. Now they have been blessed with Nestle money. That makes a difference. Longer school days, more PLC time, etc. So let's not forget that they've been blessed, and rightly so, very deserving, and have made very good use of the Nestle money. And it's getting better because the Satterberg Foundation is giving us money for the feeder schools to the three middle schools, Denny, Aki, and Mercer, so that the kids will come in even more prepared. But without the generosity of those folks, because we know the folks in Olympia don't have any generosity, we, we can't leverage like we've been able to do. And, and when people say to you, well, folks just aren't spending the money wisely, please point them at these three schools because that's results. That's absolutely results, but that's private money. That's not government money. Makes me a little crazier than I am already. Um, Fauntleroy 100, Fauntleroy Elementary School, of which I am a proud graduate, uh, 100th anniversary is this Sunday at the school at 1.30 p.m. Please come on down. It, it will be, it will be rocking. Um, we hear you. We hear you regarding the wait list. Boy, do we hear you. I think I counted 300 emails. I know there is an outstanding public disclosure request. I am so looking forward to seeing that data, as I'm sure many folks are. And, and I am confused, and I have spent a great deal of time with Associate Superintendent Herndon discussing these issues, as well as with Superintendent Nyland. And I honestly cannot figure out why we cannot move the Ingram wait list, whose principal says, we have room and we'll take them all to relieve the overcrowding at Garfield and Roosevelt and Ballard. I, maybe I'm just, quote, not getting it, but I don't, I don't get it. And, and I'm very frustrated by it. Um, I'm also frustrated that we went to neighborhood schools several years ago with the thought that we would raise all boats, that we would make those, quote, underperforming schools, and I, I hate that term because I don't like the data and the, the lenses used in that, so that all of our schools would be good schools. And, and I keep thinking, well, if we harm a school, can we, can we fix that underlying issues at that school and still move those wait lists? Do I appreciate that it's connected to money? I absolutely do. Do I appreciate that some schools have had long standing over decades of problems and, and not of their own making and not of the community's making? I'm not suggesting that by any stretch. But there's got to be a better way. And when you look at the student assignment transition plan, please keep the T in there because it still belongs there. It does not say anything about blocking the wait list based on the harm to other schools. Does not say it. Now, do I think that that's the best written piece of prose on the planet? No, I find it highly confusing. <coughs> and I'm supposed to be an insider. So maybe there's a way we can do more pictures in the future, or graphs, or charts, or, or not make promises that our wallet cannot keep. And, and getting folks hopes up because it's not transparent, and it, and it violates trust, and it's very problematic when that's one of our SMART goals. And a whole lot of fabulous people are working really hard on this, 
And it's not so easy, folks. And when someone says, there was a quote that I heard tonight, and when the board is, quote, sitting back, end quote, oh, I highly disagree with you on a whole list of issues when you say that about this issue. Do you see what we do every day? You really don't. We are working really hard on this, and, and these are really tough conversations to have. But a great many of us on this dais are having those conversations. And, and please feel free to come to committee meetings. That's where a lot of the, the stuff is being done. Um, so I hear your frustration. We on the dais hear your frustration. The folks on the walls hear your frustration. I'm told some of these lists are going to move soon. Um, the concept of waiting until the end of May for folks to make their choices about highly capable placement when those decisions are made in February is crazy making to me and I hope to be able to change that piece of the student assignment plan next uh, fall. Director Burke, who is sleeping in China, um, has some of the same frustrations and same goals and aims, and I believe that a great many senior staff do as well, because I, I know that they don't appreciate how difficult this is. Um, CTE issues. I want you to know that Principal Goldsman is at a child school event this evening, otherwise he would be here to talk about CTE. I'm a huge fan. I believe in CTE. 15 years on the work retraining task force at Highline College. Uh, this stuff makes a huge difference in people's lives to make a living wage. Uh, and a great many folks that go through career technical education end up in college as well. So it's interconnected. Um, other hot issues. The assessment policy and ethnic studies are very hot issues. The curriculum and instruction committee is a fairly um, provocative place these days. But I learned something in spending some time with my good friend Phyllis Campagno uh, recently, the Seattle Education Association president. Their resident assembly or their RA meetings are the same nights that our curriculum and instruction meetings are at. How, how did, with all the brains in the SEA and in the Seattle School District, how, how did we not match that up? So I think that just means we need to talk to each other more. So why weren't you there? Well, don't you know, I'm at RA. Ah. So we're going to fix that, I hope, really soon. Um, and there's, there's a good bit of work to be done on assessment policies and ethnic studies. And we've got some really good partners to do that work with. But our partners don't own that. Unfortunately, the buck stops with us here on the dais. Will we listen to you? Absolutely. Do we need to create better ways to hear from you? Absolutely. But, but we get to carry the heavy burden on the vote, on the policy. We get to send back to staff and say, eh, not working for me. You need, this is my feeling anyway. See if we can come to an agreement and, and move forward. Um, and hopefully we do that in a really elegant and collaborative way. do not have a community meeting scheduled. And I am sorry about that because I love them. My hope is I can find a place in, in West Seattle next Saturday, the 27th, to do that, or I may take up a couple of principal offers to open up their building and, and we can do it there. Um, I don't like the idea of incurring more costs because of, of custodians or, or janitors. Maybe we can figure out a time when another event is going on so it doesn't incur costs. Um, but it's a bear to, to schedule these meetings. And I want to do it before we get to the end of, of school and, and that. Um, let me wrap it up. I'm talking way too long. I apologize. Stay tuned. Stay tuned for um, some of the news coming out of Middle College High School. 
We had a lengthy and terrific meeting with Director Associate Superintendent Tully, um, Executive Director Helen Young, who Middle College High School is under her umbrella, and with the principal, Jennifer Knisley. And, and they get it, and we're working together, and um, stay tuned, because each of these three middle college sites presently will kind of have their own unique um, program. But social justice is absolutely going back to the University of Washington. It may look a little different than it looked in the past, but there'll be more um, linkage, I think is the way to say that, with the University of Washington, and that's really exciting. Um, and we have not given up on having a West Seattle site for middle college, not by any stretch. So, um, League of Women Voters, Friday night, it was a good time, except then I heard that we, between city council member and good, well-meaning people, uh, managed to drop the ball on communication. So you're having a lovely evening and then you find out that why haven't you X, Y, or Z? Speechless, not often. We're fixing it this week. Uh, and, and our relationships and getting back with folks are, are critical. And, and this is a situation where there was $600,000 worth of money on the table. So we aim to go get it and we aim to repair that and move on and figure out better ways to communicate. Um, again, it is my privilege and my honor to serve this work. It, for the folks that are thinking about running, you will never be the same. And it will be a long, hot summer. You will find out who your friends are. You will have to figure out what really matters to you in terms of priorities. But it's, it's some of the most gratifying work. And, and if you can see your fingerprints on some small incremental change, it feels so good. On the other hand, it'll drive you crazy because of the pace of the change is too slow. At least it's, it's working on me on that. So I will stop and go to action items. First step. I'm sorry. I apologize, Superintendent. A brief brain break. I found my uh, quote from my student. <clears throat> This is the next Noah Purcell. This is from a, an opi opinion writing class at uh, Madison. Dear Dr. Nyland, when you imagine a lunchtime in middle school or elementary school, you probably imagine buying milk. Most kids in that line just want lunch, and a few, if any, in the cafeteria want the milk provided. Is this what you want? For the white milk to waste away in lunchrooms and have wasted the money on milk? Having children not receive milk's nutritional benefits? Serving chocolate milk will change this. Goes on with three uh, citations. Chocolate milk should be available in cafeterias because more kids will get milk's health benefits, cafeteria sales will increase, and kids may be more agreeable. So, <laughs> so go far. Action items, number one. Amending policy number <laughs> 6022 brought forward at the Audit and Finance Committee on April 18th for consideration. Do I have a motion? Yes, I move the school board amend policy number 6022 economic stabilization account as attached to the board action report. Second the motion. Would you be so kind as to school us up on this please? So, Ricky, Assistant Superintendent for Business and Finance. Sorry, I wasn't um, prepared to go over it again. Um, so this policy is coming before you to make changes to how the economic stabilization account could be used. This policy is necessary to align with the budget decisions that the board had reached consensus on um, in November. Questions, comments, concerns from my fellow directors? Roll call, please. Director Blanford? Aye. Director Geary? Aye. Director Patu? Aye. Director Pinkham? Aye. Director Harris? Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. 
Number two, uh, two action items tonight. Purchase of student and staff computers for new BEX 4 schools and BTA 3 projects opening summer 2017. This came to Ops 4. You need a second. Before, I'm sorry, please second the motion. I'll make the motion first here. <clears throat> I move that the school board authorize the superintendent to execute purchase orders through bid number 06691 with Thornburg for a total not to exceed $1.6 million plus Washington State sales tax over fiscal years 2016-2017 in the form of the draft purchase orders attached to the board action report with any minor additions, deletions, and modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent and take any necessary actions to implement the purchase orders. I second the motion. This item was heard by the Ops Committee on April the 20th and moved forward for approval. Would you like to give us a thumbnail of this, please, sir? Sure. John Kroll, Chief Information Officer. I'm bringing this forward for the purchase of computers for teachers and students uh, for the schools that are opening in fall 2017. I'd like to bring to your attention an addendum since it was introduced. Um, I had uh, Associate Superintendent Michael Tully um, reach out to his staff because the computers for the students and the teachers are actually a teaching and learning uh, purchase. Um, we included uh, a letter from two of our uh, principals at the, at the schools, and we also included the survey, which was some of our engagement on what the schools wanted. So there was in the board action report between introduction and in action um, by the addition of this addendum. Um, this addendum, of course, as was just mentioned, is a letter from the Eagle staff and MENI design teams. And basically, they are indicating that the uh, flexibility provided by having laptop computers um, it will definitely increase the, um, the opportunities to expand uh, learning outside the classroom and increased student uh, collaboration efforts. Um, that's the focus of that. There was also a survey that was conducted of the acting principals for the school's opening, and they are all in support of uh, laptop computers. Questions, concerns, comments? Director Patu. So are these laptops for all the new schools, for all the teachers, and then the also computers for the kids? I mean, um, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, it's going to be a cart with 16 computers for each, each classroom with laptops for the students. And the, the teachers are actually going to have uh, desktops. So is this happening with all the other schools, our other schools? Do they all have laptops also for the teachers and for the kids? Or is this just for the new schools? This is, this is just for the new schools. This purchase is just for the new schools. So why is that? Why do we only have it for new schools and not for all the rest of the other schools? The this is a question that actually was addressed to me by many teachers in the various schools. Uh, why don't we have laptops? Tacoma School District has laptops for every teacher. And I think that that's something that we need to look at for our, yes, we don't have any money, but it's something we need to look at because we're outdated in terms of technology. Uh, th thanks for bringing that up. We are working on an RFP. Uh, to bring laptops to all the teachers district-wide. That's why we're doing, doing that separately. I anticipate uh, that coming to the board uh, hopefully in June. Uh, so that will be laptops for all teachers, all uh, members of SEA. So that would include uh, counselors, et cetera. Thank you. Blanford. Is my understanding correct that because this is uh, B Bex and BTA funding that it would just be directed at the schools that are opening in 2017? Uh, th this particular purchase and the timing of it is that's why it's for the schools. Uh, we have a separate item as I mentioned for the teachers and we actually have BTA for money for more uh, technology for all schools and we are going to be doing a uh, getting the board up to speed with a um, uh, 
work session. Board work session. Board work session. Thank you. We're going to do a board work session uh, coming up that will be focused on student devices and how the technology is in support of teaching and learning. So the board will sit down with Associate Superintendent Tully, uh, Chief of Instruction uh, Curriculum and Instruction uh, Kyle Kinoshito, and myself, uh, perhaps some others, to to go over how. It'll be the instruction that will drive the technology or the curriculum will drive, if there's digital curriculum, it'll come uh, you know, approved from uh, the curriculum instruction department. It won't be uh, you know, the department of, of technology uh, just deciding what's needed in the classrooms. I'll finish my comment by um, just remarking on the fact that uh, the, uh, the attachments that are provided here actually do a really good job of helping us to understand how curriculum works in service or how technology works in service of the curriculum and not the other way around. Um, I look forward to the uh, work session where we'll have a chance to go deeper into that subject and get a more clear understanding of kind of the philosophy around technology and how it dovetails or works really closely with curriculum and instruction to improve outcomes for our students. So I appreciate that. And, it, and I hope that in the future, when it makes sense to, um, to include statements from our educators about how this will benefit them, that's really useful information for us, particularly as we are struggling with budget challenges and trying to figure out how to prioritize and uh, allocate resources to increase instruction in this time of um, need. So thank you for that. And thank you for bringing that up. Other comments, questions or concerns? My turn then. Uh, I'd like to channel uh, Director Burke who is not here tonight, and um, I feel very much, again, like we're putting the cart before the horse because of time. We heard this exact same conversation a year ago when we opened up the last schools and the concern. We're going to get to the point of where we define a technology educational policy. How do we choose this? I appreciate very much that everyone's plates are very full, but this is a rich and deep and lengthy conversation. Now, am I going to tell the new schools, no, you can't have computers? No, I'm not going to do that. I don't, I, but, but this is the second time in two years where, where I've made votes in order not to stop new schools opening with righteous equipment where we have not done the hard work of figuring out where the overlays are. And, and there are very cynical folks out there that would suggest that if we just give all the kids computers and then we don't need that many teachers and I couldn't disagree more vehemently. I also think that we don't buy things off the shelf because it's quote technology if it has some of the issues in it that we address in our curriculum um, system to look at things like racial bias, to look at whether or not that's the best program out there. Uh, you know, we've got 10 sets of middle school math books upstairs, but, but our technology is not being vetted the same way and it's every bit curriculum. So I, I really hope we're not gonna have the same conversation next year. I, we, we gotta put it on our plate and we gotta raise it to the top. And, and as you know, Mr. Kroll, um, we've been very, very candid with you about your predecessor and his desire for a one-to-one -one program. Um, but, but that's not policy making. That's not okay. We don't wanna make policy because of deadlines and budgets. Thank you. Thank you. Call please. Director Geary. Aye. Director Patu. Director Pinkham? Aye. Director Blanford? Aye. Director Harris? Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you. We are now to introduction. One, approval of the 2017-2018 school year calendar. 
This came out of the Executive Committee on May 4th for consideration. Dr. Codd, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening. Clover Codd, Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources. So we're here tonight uh, to present to the full board the proposed calendar for the 2017-2018 school year. The development of this school year calendar is a subject of bargaining with our Seattle Education Association partners and others. Additionally, it's important to remember that in the 2015-2018 collective bargaining agreement that we came to a, an agreement with with SEA, we specifically added 20 minutes to the school day and that we would have an, a weekly early release for next school year. We agreed to negotiate the implementation and the effects of those changes in an interest-based bargaining manner, meaning we would work with SEA to determine our common interests and goals for the time and find options and solutions that would best meet the needs of our students and our educators. We spent a significant portion of the winter and spring doing just that. The negotiations resulted in the proposed calendar, which provides for a 75-minute early release weekly to occur on Wednesdays, and an elimination of the five half-day early releases that we have previously had in the past. Several questions have been raised regarding the level of community engagement, our process, and rationale for the time and day of the week. I'm hoping to be able to provide some additional context here tonight, and then, of course, we'll be happy to answer any questions once we've done so. So we began the process um, thinking about our shared interests for the additional student time as well as a teacher collaboration time. And the district and the union have a shared interest in finding additional time for teachers to collaborate. Effective collaboration improves teacher and student performance. The professional culture of collaboration requires educators to share thoughts, strategies, provide support to each other, and explore together. Collaboration time also allows for staff to plan rigorous and appropriate lessons for students. Uh, we heard from Denny International Middle School what an important strategy that was um, to meeting their school goals. In addition to the shared interests, we also looked at data to inform the options and solutions that we would come up with. We did survey community, educators, and family members early in the fall and collected that data asking them their preferred day of the week for an early release whether or not the teacher collaboration time should occur at the beginning of the day, the end of the day, um, and should we have, um, we did also ask them about how we should split up the 20 minutes at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, split between the two. We did look at that data along with other multiple data points. We looked at data on teacher absenteeism throughout the week. We looked at data on fail to fill rates, we, which is basically a fancy word for um, have, can't, we can't find substitutes to fill the openings on certain days. Um, and we looked across these data points along with our collective bargaining agreement provisions, other system constraints, and made the decision in collaboration with SEA at the table and determined to make the best use of teacher collaboration time, Wednesday early release would be the best option for our context in Seattle Public Schools. So where did this 75 minutes come from? How did we get there? We sort of heard about this one hour early release earlier on in the year. So in addition um, to these weekly early releases that we had bargained, we had these five half day early releases still sitting inside our collective bargaining agreement that we have traditionally had. Um, and those, those hours, 10 hours essentially, were aimed at teacher professional development, whole school professional development. Uh, the time which is sitting inside the CBA must be negotiated if we're going to make changes to that time. So the educators in the room, both sides of the table, um, felt that the 10 hours of professional development time was essential, but that instead of having these additional five half-day early releases in addition to the weekly early releases, that we would get rid of the five half-days and we would take that time and split it apart across the year um, coming up with 15 minutes spread across, across 36 weeks getting to our um, professional development time. Some people have asked, so you're adding 20 minutes a day, but you're taking away 75 minutes a week. Kind of what's the point? Why are you doing that? Isn't that just five minutes a day? Um, but when you add that time up throughout the school year, we're actually adding a little more than two additional student days of learning time and 35 hours of teacher professional development and collaboration time within the teacher educator workday. That's significant. 
At this time, I'd like to open it up um, for my SEA partners to say a few words, my teaching and learning colleagues, if they have anything to add, and then we'll, we'll have you ask your questions, do our best to answer them. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank Clover for uh, um, giving SCA the opportunity to uh, speak to uh, our perspective of the negotiations. Um, I'm Michael Tamayo, I'm an elementary educator and vice president of SCA. Um, so as you're aware, the SCA and SPS have been engaged in this interest-based bargain over the over the past six months, and um, it's truly it's truly been it's truly been a uh, collaborative and interest-based process. Uh, both sides struggled uh, through the process. Uh, both sides had challenges. Uh, we problem solved together and celebrated together what we were able to get through. Um, throughout the process, we didn't see eye to eye on, uh, on a lot of things, uh, but in the end, uh, both sides did come, uh, did come to an agreement uh, that was ratified by our membership. Uh, but then I think more importantly, uh, we came to uh, mutual respect for the process. Uh, I, had the, I was uh, served on the bargaining team for SEA in 2015, sitting across across the table from uh, many people in the room here, and I could tell you, I could tell you for, uh, there, there are many lessons learned and opportunities to take, uh, to take advantage of through this process, and so we're looking to uh, further, uh, further that uh, with the district. Um, there are two things that we want to uh, specific, specifically address. Um, you know, there was the issue that uh, educators and central staff came out on, uh, came out on Wednesdays, and uh, family, families who, uh, who were surveyed came out, came out on Fridays. Uh, one thing that I wanted to address is that um, educators are the, front, are, are the frontline communicators with families every single day, um, every single day throughout the school year. And one could assume that educators advocating for NCAs were, ad, were advocating purely based on you know, personal interest. Um, and I think that's a, that's a, that's a misconception. Uh, we speak to families every single day, through, uh, every single day. We hear their, we hear their concerns. Their educators are the first people that families go to when they have questions around, you know, why are we doing 20 minutes? Why are we talking about doing an early release? And so if, pe if people are pitting people against each other, I'd, like, I'd just like to say that educators are the ones who, you know, listen to the families who can't come to school board meetings, who can't come to weekend co uh, listening sessions. And so when educators advocate, we advocate first and, foremost, first and foremost for the educational interest of our families and our students. And so I think that's, that's I wanted to put that out there uh, for the board to recognize is that it was so, it, Wednesdays wasn't just for teachers, it was we were advocating for our families and students and for the educational interest. There's a natural ebb and flow of, of, of if, you work f if you work every day in a, uh, in a school, there's a natural ebb and flow of energy. Uh, f uh, Mondays, Monday through Friday. It kind of goes like this. You, everybody starts Monday here excited for the school week and then it ramps up. Wednesday, teachers and students are hitting their groove. You know, we're, we're, the, the week, we're not thinking about the weekend, we're thinking about school, we're hitting that groove. As Thursday and Friday, you know, uh, students get tired, uh, educators get tired, but people look forward to the weekends. True collaboration, uh, we've been doing this on Wednesdays um, ever since I've been in the district. And so for true collaboration to happen, for true energy around that collaboration PD to happen, Wednesdays is the ideal time uh, for staff uh, to be able to come together and do this critical work. It's for the benefit of the students, it's for the benefit of educators, and so I wanted to put that out there as, you know, we, came, we struggled through it, that's the agreement we came to. I'll be happy to uh, stay and stick around and answer any questions that you may have, but I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Michael. So I guess we'll answer it. Up, uh, we'll open it up for um, questions that you may still have. Comments, questions, concerns, fellow colleagues. Please, Director Blanfer. I'll just say that um, I appreciate the explanation because uh, in many of our community meetings and in many conversations that we have with constituents, uh, parents, and families, there's there's always a wondering and a, a need for explanation for why um, professional development uh, keeps kids out of classrooms. And you know, I I know enough about education theory to know that collaboration is critically important for us to improve instruction for all students, and particularly to resolve our achievement and opportunity gaps. So my hope is that um, we'll figure out a way to as we're announcing this that we'll figure out a way to share our findings and how we got to this point so that um, people out in the community who are affected by it know the rationale and have a deep understanding of the rationale which will make it easier for them folks to buy in. Thank you. 
Associate Superintendent Tully, did you have something to add, sir? Yeah, in response to that, um, and this is truly a collaboration because, as you're indicating, there was competing priorities. There was a desire for increased teacher collaboration, uh, example being what was presented this evening by Denny Middle School, um, but also understanding that uh, um, instructional time is critically important as well. So the work of um, our partnership with SEA and the district to say, okay, then we need to increase the amount of instructional time to benefit both goals uh, was a real um, success story here. And we need to think, look at that through those lens. Director Geary. In terms of communication, I think this is also an excellent um, opportunity to get down to that um, MTSS elevator speech in terms of this being that data review collaboration and being consistent in our messaging around that because I think I've mentioned in some of the committees that people still are unclear and so this is just another opportunity to say we are moving forward with this strategy and this is a really critical piece of it to make it work and reinforcing that we're, we're working in sync, not just sort of scattershot. Anybody else wants to address this? I'm up. Um, Dr. Codd, thank you for your candor. Thank you for your willingness to um, have thoughtful, sometimes testy conversations. It's very much appreciated. And, and I think that conflict doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. I think sometimes it, it brings up different viewpoints and we can do better next time. Would you suggest that the messaging and the community engagement on this was our best job? Well, I don't know if I can speak to that. What I do know is that um, we were asked, I believe by the board, early in the fall to go out and do a survey far and wide um, to collect and gather data around people's preferences with respect to these issues. Um, beyond that, I do not know what our community engagement strategy was around this because I'm particularly interested in going to the negotiating table and my focus is on building that relationship with our labor partners and coming to a conclusion around that. So looks like our chief engagement strategy officer is here to talk about that. Gary Campbell, chief engagement officer. So I think that, so as you know, we've been rolling out a new community, community engagement model and I worked with Michael's team to help to determine the level of that model that we would engage the community in, which is level two, which is consult. I think the thing that we could have improved is making the decision-making process clearer for our families. So if the calendar and the 20 minutes and early release are all part of the negotiated conversation, we needed to make that clear, uh, clearer and the communication to our families, that they were sharing their preference, but that we had to weigh that preference against multiple data points. So that's an area that I think we could improve in the future. And, and perhaps we could add into that the role that our labor partners play in this and why, why they have a voice. They, Absolutely. Again, the why. Absolutely. And, and I just, I'm, I'm, I'm saddened by the, lack of trust that some people feel for us mm -hmm. and and we've made some real progress I don't want to backslide on that the other is um, how many of our surrounding school districts have Wednesday early releases and did those districts survive that transition whether it was not pleasant the transition come on up. Sure. Michael can answer something sure. Scribbled that part off my notes, but I could, I could do that. Um, so, so cur currently, uh, Lake Washington, Bellevue, and North Shore school districts have Wednesday early releases. Uh, the combined total of their student populations is about 68,000. Uh, so, Seattle, Seattle's roughly 55,000 students wouldn't be alone in having uh, Wednesday early releases. Um, Highline does have a Friday early release. They have about 15,000 students. Uh, those are the surrounding districts that uh, SEA researched when we were advocating uh, for this uh, with our membership. 
Could you share your research with our community engagement team and whoever's oh. going to write the the one or two pager for the Friday memo? Sure. It makes it simple, and 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 we absolutely will give you credit for it. Thank you. Uh, I'll I'll credit Carrie. <laughs> Any other comments, concerns, Director Blanford? Um, it, without opening up a a big can of worms, I'm just wondering if there are any metrics around who we engaged with in getting feedback about this process, meaning out in the community. Is there anything you can tell us about? I, I always go under the assumption that um, we frequently are talking to the people who have the time and the, the wherewithal to be engaged with us. and. I, I always wonder if those who are affected by the decisions are involved in that process, involved in the process of decision making, or if we are relying on a small segment of our total population to uh, speak for all, and particularly on an issue like this that has implications for um, before and after school time, um, if we've engaged with a broad enough segment of the population to be able to to represent that we've talked to the to the universe yeah so that's a great question so 11,000 families responded which is a good a pretty good percentage for the short uh, time period that we had and we also sent it to all of our community based organizations and I'd have to get you that the raw number on that mm -hmm. but it was a number of them that responded and the family and the partner responses were very similar mm -hmm. but one thing that I asked for Sherry and Misa to do is disaggregate the data by um, demographics so we could see if there were differences in the the types of responses we were getting and there weren't between subgroups of families and so um, that's something that we can share in the Friday board memo. It, it, just for future reference, I think it would be really helpful when we are when we are celebrating the fact that we've done community mm -hmm. engagement, that uh, it just be part of the the presentation that we get some sense of how representative the sample is. Because yeah. I hear eleven thousand, I think that's great. That's mm -hmm. you know that's uh, one fifth of our families, mm -hmm. but it would be. Um, it, we might be, we might not get what we need mm -hmm. if that one fifth were very concentrated right. by neighborhood, by uh, racial or ethnic group, by income level, by you know so many other measures. Right. Um, and we have seen in the past where we've done community engagement, and then later on we've discovered that uh, there were communities that that felt like they didn't have any say in the matter. And um, I think as we attenuate and we get stronger in our community engagement, mm -hmm. that'll just become part of the mm -hmm. part of the presentation. But my hope is to kind of seed that and say mm -hmm. that's the kind of data that I want to mm -hmm. see is how representative the uh, group is when we're when we're patting ourselves on the back mm -hmm. around our community mm -hmm. engagement. Absolutely, thank you, Director Geary. Just um, a thought that occurred to me around this idea of community engagement is that we have to acknowledge that it's going to be so hard to gather the information that no survey is ever going to be perfect. Because when you give somebody the choice to say what's best for you, they will say what is best for you in a bubble. And if you say, considering that you could maximize you know, teacher collaboration time, if it is done on X or Y or Z, which would be your preference? How would you weigh that against your own needs? What, you know, and so I just think, while it's impossible to ever draft the perfect tool, um, I, I just throw that out. We just need to be mindful of that because there will always be that question that went unasked that we then have to explain after the fact. And so I just acknowledge that, that your job is incredibly hard and I appreciate that you do it with a smile, Carrie, um, over and over again and I think our families appreciate that as well. So thank you. I might just add to that, um, not only is that a really good point, but how we frame what we're asking, why we're asking is really important. Um, Dr. Nyland talks to us about that every day. Um, but I also just want to add 
um, what a great success this proposed calendar is for our students and for our educators. We just found 35 additional hours for our educators, not just our teachers, but our paraprofessionals, our, our um, office professionals to be engaged in professional learning opportunities during their contracted workday, which is really, really important. And we've added two whole student learning days throughout the year, which we should all be celebrating. So this is um, an opportunity for people to uh, not just engage in professional development and collaboration, but have common planning time. We've got job alike days, um, where if you're an art specialist, you can meet with other art specialists, etc. So this was a lot of good work and good thinking, and I don't want that to get lost in the, um, the things that may not have gone as well. Appreciate that very much, and I hope you highlight that in, in your uh, Friday memo. Thank you. Okay. Number two, approval of the City of Seattle Project Services Contract, Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction, slash United States Department of Agriculture, OSPI, USDA, 2017 Summer Food Services Program. And that went to OPS on April 20th for consideration. Thank you. Good evening, Teresa Fields, Director for Nutrition Services. This is our um, long-standing contract that we've had with the City of Seattle to provide meals um, um, throughout the city along with our summer learning um, programs. The contract is for nine weeks starting June 28th through August 25th in the amount of $646,949. Um, accepting this contract um, will um, generate revenue for the district and also provide summer employment opportunities for nutrition services staff. Questions, comments, concerns? May I just say from the advantage of the podium on the record, congratulations on your promotion. Thank you. Okay, three, accepting transportation and crossing guard grants from the City of Seattle. This came before ANF May 11th for approval. Thank you. We are introducing this board action report for the school board to consider accepting funds from the city for two transportation related programs. The first one is the crossing guard program. For about 40 years and until six years ago, the city managed and funded the crossing guard program. When the city eliminated their program, the district continued to believe in its importance and began managing and funding the program. At this time, and due to the $50 million budget deficit, the district has asked the city to begin funding this program again while the district continues to manage the program. The estimated revenue to support this program is about $400,000. The next program is the two-tier bell time schedule. After several years of study, recommendations from two bell times task force and community engagement, last year the school board approved adjusting start times to the times that research, research shows aligns best to students' circadian rhythms, also known as their body clocks. This new schedule promotes an increase in student sleep, and our most recent Healthy Youth Survey confirms this res these results. While most of our state adolescents were reporting less sleep as, of, um, as compared to 2014, many more of our Seattle school teens indicated that they were getting much more sleep. That is, that they were sleeping more than eight hours a night. This school year, secondary schools began starting school later in the second tier, and most elementary schools were moved to the first tier. But because of funding, the district was unable to move the final 12 schools left in the third tier to into the earlier tiers. After much conversations this fall, and with the addition of the 20 minutes to the instructional day, the board continued to believe that the district should attempt to move all schools into the first two tiers. Since the state funds transportation on a reimbursement basement, basis and given the budget constraints, the school board asked the superintendent to seek one-time external funding by May 1st to support this change. As the superintendent 
indicated earlier tonight, on April 24th, Mayor Murray announced that he would recommend to the City Council that the City fund the Crossing Guard program and this one-time one $2.3 million ask to support the Bell Times changes. As with all major decisions, the city has its own process for approval. The city council is considering the mayor's request with the proposed vote um, before June 15th. In anticipation of this vote, and so that we can notify schools and families no later than June 16th, we are asking that the school board concurrently approve acceptance of these funds if the council approves either or both of these transportation items. As with most board action reports, the board authorizes the superintendent to implement the programs with any minor adjustments that are necessary. The school board approved this language in January in the transportation standards where it approved both the uh, three tiers and two tiers if we found sufficient funding. In review of that bar, in, uh, that January bar, it's been determined that we should ensure clarity and adjust the current board action report, so I'll be bringing forward a little bit of modifications to ensure that we have clarity there. This language then would allow the superintendent to respond to community feedback on two tiers, which uh, includes the placement of the schools within the two tiers, start times, end times that are impacting student schedules due to the addition of the 20 minutes instructional time. As we consider this feedback, we are also going to continue to consider the, uh, the two recommendations that have been guiding our thinking, which are based on professional recommendations for student health and safety. These are the first recommendation from the American Academy of Pediatrics and local sleep experts who recommend that adolescents should start school after 8.30 a.m. And the second recommendation was made by the city's committee called the Seattle School Traffic Safety Committee, which recommended that elementary schools uh, begin after 7.59 a.m. to maximize safe walking to schools, particularly during the shortened days of late fall and winter. Some of the options that are being considered include starting the first tier at 7.55 and the second tier at 8.55, which is a five minute earlier shift from what was approved in January. Moving those five high schools without sports complexes to a starting time of 8.45 a.m. This would include Ballard, Cleveland, Garfield, Roosevelt, and West Seattle high schools. Moving um, T. Marshall and Adam Adams Elementary Schools to the second tier and Loyal Heights to the first tier. Our goal is to respond to our community feedback whenever possible while still meeting the requirements identified by our master use permits, budget constraints, and recommendations from professional groups. We understand that these decisions impact our families' lives and schools and we want to mitigate impacts whenever possible. If external funding is received so that the district can change to two tiers and the board approves receipt of the funding, then this will complete the major changes that the school board has requested in relation to bell times. Thank you very much. Comments, questions, concerns? Director Patu and then Director Blanford. So, so if we get the 2.3 million, that means that all the schools will be at uh, tier one and two? Yes, we will collapse all the tier three schools into either tier one or tier two, so we will be a two-tier system. Okay, thank you. Um, my question is has to do with city council. Um, has the final vote on this, um, the allocation of funds, been scheduled? Well, um, we're working on that. They did have an education committee meeting that was scheduled for today and canceled. Oh. So we are working through what's the process that the council is going to be using to move this forward. And they're very aware that we have a, a tight deadline. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Jerry? I'm looking at the bar, and I would just say in terms of the equity analysis, it's not clear whether or not we ran this through the, um, the equity tool. Okay. And I think that for a while, at least until we, we know we're doing that consistently, I think it's good to be transparent about how this language came about. And I, I do this in all the different committee meetings, so I would, I would appreciate. We'll provide some updates there. That. 
And then the other piece is clearly around the transportation. We are getting a lot of um, feedback from families about concern over the impact on our athletes. Mm -hmm. And I know this is something that we all considered when we made the vote in January. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying, you know, that we need to relitigate that decision. But it would be helpful when we're presenting on this issue, and this is not to you, but that we have somebody present. I think that that would have been an important part of this introductory conversation. Because as this is being introduced, we have a lot of people who are mm -hmm. listening to whether or not we have heard and are going and what we are doing mm -hmm. to address that. And that has pieces of transportation and the availability of fields and whether or not that's we have any flexibility to adjust that next year as well. Because I think everyone is concerned that while this mm -hmm. may meet some higher academic needs, we are certainly creating some academic problems for our athletes. And so I don't know if you want to speak to that right now or if we can be sure that when this comes up we have somebody who can provide more details about that. Well, I think we can provide somebody at uh, action, but one of the things that we have done is we have talked to all the high school principals. We are reading absolutely every email that comes in, and part of the reason that we are um, looking um, strongly at making the recommendation to move five of our high schools um, earlier because they don't have sports complex, that was just because of this particular feedback. So yes, we are definitely listening um, to this and we're trying to manage um, all of these adjustments within all of the constraints that we have. We've had some um, high school uh, feedback saying, well, okay, why can't you just move the elementary schools earlier, 15, 20 minutes earlier, and we have to work through the school safety recommendations about how early we can um, have our first tier schools. So it is a complex problem that we are trying to solve. We are listening to everybody and we're, we're looking at both the recommendations that the community is making to see if they are viable and feasible and can we do them, but we're listening to that feedback. Mm -hmm. Other comments, questions, concerns? Director Pinkham. So how does this impact other funding that we're getting from the city of Seattle as far as metro bus passes? Um, and I'm just curious uh, why this went through audit and finance versus operations? It seems like this is more also an operations kind of issue. So the reason it went through audit and finance was because that meeting happened before this meeting. So we will be uh, able to talk about it at operations, but it was simply a timing issue. And because we're just receiving funds from the city, that was, um, we decided that that would be an appropriate place to move it forward to the uh, this, uh, board. Um, as far as Metro cards and ORCA cards, it really <coughs> is unrelated to that. It has no impact on, on um, any of the Prop 1 funding or any of the Metro cards that we're using. Please, go ahead, Director I, Blanford. I, I was, given the fact that there's a lot of um, concern out in the community as well as uh, school board director concern, and um, I would suggest to my colleagues that are particularly on the um, executive committee that this not be an item that ends up on the consent agenda. It <laughs> seems to me to be one that uh, requires quite a bit more conversation before we take it to a vote. So um, that would be my request. I could not agree with you more, sir. Um, I have some. There have been times. Thank you. Uh, I have some concerns that, that I wanted to have vetted out mm -hmm. in the future for action. Don't need to do it now, but, but we need to address them. Mm -hmm. uh, we heard in one work session or committee that the guarantee of school bus funding by the state retroactively is no longer a guarantee, that some mm -hmm. of the rules have changed. Mm -hmm. That needs to be vetted and discussed. Mm -hmm. Second, we had a rich conversation, I thought, at ANF and Audit and Finance about how with the two tiers, we may not have as many students leaving school as early to get to their games and that we could also reduce our reliance on private bus systems to get our athletes across town. Mm -hmm. If you could address those two, I think that would be very, very helpful. And, and again, the 
as you stated appropriately, the concern on this is high, mm -hmm. and the devil's in the details. Yes, it is. Could you also address the fact that this went before the uh, levy committee, mm -hmm. and uh, of those attending the committee, the majority was to deny this use of funds, So, and what, what the next steps are? Um, so this was um, discussed at the Levy Oversight Committee. Um, there were seven members who were there who were voting on this. Um, at a vote of four to three, um, they um, decided to uh, recommend to the city that um, the city find some funding for two tiers, but that they don't use levy funds. Um, they wanted to keep the levy funds focused on eliminating the opportunity gap, and um, they thought that other departments, such as transportation, also had underspend, and that they should be looking at those uh, funding sources to, to fund this. Thank you. I look forward to hearing the feedback. Excuse me, Director Blanford, please. Was there testimony uh, regarding the legality of um, using uh, families and ed levy funds is that the it was that the crux of the issue um, I think that there were some people who were questioning the legality there were people from the city that were saying yes it was legal and we could do it and there was a way to do it legally so there was there was a lack of clarity as to whether or not it's legal my understanding is that the legal staff of the city had reviewed and said it was appropriate to draw funds from the mm -hmm. families and ed levy that's correct but there are members of that committee, committee who in spite of the fact that they received that legal advice didn't yes. believe it was an appropriate use of families and levy, ed levy dollars i think Is that's that a good description of okay. what happened there thank you thank you superintendent nyland your um, comments concerns and thanks. questions uh, city staff uh recommended a change to the ordinance i believe Mm -hmm. uh, that would have permitted it. So, mm -hmm. uh, somewhere kind of in the middle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. the city thought there was a way to get to legal, but didn't think that it was quite legal the way that the current ordinance was written. So, so would it have had to, would the ordinance have had to be changed? And that's what the city council would have to vote on. Would yes. vote on to make the change, which yes. would then allow the yes. funds to flow. Correct. Got it. Right. Perfect. Thank you for that clarification. Any other comments, concerns, questions? Director Pinkham. I guess my, I, I have a slight concern that maybe when this sounds like it went to audit and finance because they met before our meeting here. Mm -hmm. uh, did our audit and finance people feel like they were informed enough <laughs> to make a recommendation, whereas maybe the operations committee is more familiar with this kind of process. So it just seems kind of weird that we <laughs> we would do that when we have another team that's a little bit more in tune with uh, what this is asking. So is that a well, common I'll, practice I'll that we'll do again, that maybe so, a CNI issue will go to the operations because operations is meeting. Uh, it seems like there should be some other venue to vet that so it gets on the agenda for a regular board meeting. So it's not unusual practice um, as far as what I have seen to go to a, another committee um, as long as it's aligned to the work that they're doing. And, and uh, certainly uh, Director Harris can speak to um, the feelings of the committee, whether they had enough information to make a recommendation. That does not preclude it coming to operations committee this week. We can adjust the, um, the, so that we can have a conversation and make a recommendation out of operations committee also. Director Blanford, your comments, so, please. So, so um, as you well know, I chair the operations committee and serve on the audit and finance committee. And when I first saw this, I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. But um, ultimately, it has to do with the acceptance of funds from the city. And so I thought it was appropriate to have it routed through the uh, Audit and Finance Committee and, and feel reasonably comfortable. Um, I have my concerns about the legality or illegality of um, having funds come from the families and ed levy but i wasn't terribly bothered by the fact that it went to audit and finance i think 
if if there needs to be another set of eyes looking at it in um, the operations committee, we have a pretty full agenda tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, but um, if it needs to come there as well, then I think it would be appropriate. And for that, I just wanted to just put that out there, just some little concerns that I was thinking about. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Number five, resolution 2016-17-23, excuse me, summer learning, excuse me. Number four, City of Seattle Families and Ed Levy, funding for Seattle Public Schools for summer learning 2017 and 2017-18 school year. This came before the Audit and Finance Committee May 11th for consideration. Thank you, Mr. Stone. Good evening, um, Michael Stone, Director of Grants and Fiscal Compliance. Bringing, toward, bringing to you tonight uh, $16.9 million from the City of Seattle family and ed Families and Education Levy um, for their annual funding. As you know, this was passed in uh, 2011 by the voters of Seattle. Um, the City of Seattle Department of Education and Early Learning conducted a thorough RFI to allocate these dollars out to buildings. Um, this year, we added two more elementary schools for 17, 18, I should say, and they actually put additional funding out for one high school. Um, that will be awarded to Cleveland High School. So that is in addition to the funding they had. That brings us up to having 43 uh, schools, 21 elementary schools, 17 middle schools, and five high schools that receive the funding, plus our family support worker program and um, health education um, or health clinics at, um, let me jump to that page, uh, 20 or at our nine comprehensive high schools, um, middle schools, and elementary schools. Questions, comments, and concerns from my colleagues? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now we're on number five. Resolution 2016, 17-23, allowing usage of a portion of the economic stabilization account, which went through audit and finance May 11th for approval. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent Berge. Jolyn Berge, Assistant Superintendent for Business and Finance. So this board action report is necessary to allow the usage of $11.5 million of the economic stabilization account to balance the 17-18 budget. Directors were made aware of the recommendation and reached consensus to use this account to help balance the budget as part of the November 22nd, 2016 budget work session. This follows the action item you have approved tonight regarding the change um, to the board policy on allowable uses of this account. It was necessary to first approve the policy change and then bring this item forward. Attached to the bar is the resolution required to approve this action. Um, also attached is a repayment plan for restoring the $11.5 million starting with school year 18-19. And um, attached is the earlier approved board policy 6022 economic stabilization account. The repayment plan maps out a minimum annual re repayment amount. This plan would be reviewed and updated annually as now required by this new board policy. Currently, the plan is to repay the economic stabilization account beginning in school year 2018-19 with payments of $2.3 million per year for five years. That concludes my remarks. Colleagues have questions, concerns, or comments? My comment is I was beyond shocked that we didn't have a repayment plan on the earlier resolution. So to me, this is very much progress. Thank you. Thank you. Number six, approval of the annual Head Start grant. This came before Audit and Finance, May 11, for approval. Gene Guzzi, Program Manager, Head Start. Good evening. Uh, this is the annual Head Start, the a annual application for the Head Start grant that comes before the board each year. And uh, this year, we are looking to access funds from the Administration for Children and Families of a little over 4.5 million to serve uh, 360 children and families in nine of our elementary schools uh, throughout the district next year. 
The, uh, this application was developed in partnership with the Head Start Policy Council and was approved by the Policy Council last week. And then, as noted, uh, we presented at the Audit and Finance Committee as well. Do my colleagues have questions, comments, or concerns? Thank you very much. Thank you. you can go home. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven, approval of the 2017-18 Student Rights and Responsibilities. This came before CNI May 8th. For consideration. Thank you. Good evening, Erin Romanic, Program Manager, Discipline. I'm proud to stand here in front of you tonight to present the draft of the 2017-18 Student Rights and Responsibilities document. First, I want to acknowledge the school leaders who met monthly to provide input to the revisions you have in front of you. Without their dedication and support, I have no doubt the revisions would not have been as thoughtful as they are today. Katie May and Sabrina Kovac Storley from Thurgood Marshall Elementary, Lori Kazanjan and Dr. Chris Thomas from Martin Luther King Jr. Elementary, Monique Manuel from Van Asselt Elementary, Lisa Clayton, Pathfinder K-8, Nikisha Holmes, Lowell Elementary, Drew O'Connell, Annie Patu and Jeff Lamb from Franklin High School, Andra Mon from Old Van Asselt, Anita Roberson, Madison Middle School, Garth Reeves, West Seattle High School, and Elena Sanchez from Maple Elementary School. In addition, we engaged internal stakeholders within our school district, special education, our legal department, Office of Student Civil Rights, Safety and Security, Behavioral Health, Health Education, Prevention and Intervention, social emotional learning, in addition to PASS, we were able to pre present these documents to all of our assistant principals at a learner leadership learning day, as well as at the AP LLD day um, a month ago. And in addition, we also, after recommendation from the policy committee last week, um, sent the documents to the ed directors, and I had a meeting today with one of the ed directors for feedback as well. In addition, we partnered with um, the SEA Partnership Committee and presented documents to them last week and also worked with staff at Lowell Elementary, Thurgood Marshall Elementary, and Madison Middle School. We also engaged students at Lowell Elementary, Thurgood Marshall Elementary, and Hamilton Middle School. And we also had external stakeholders from Team Child, the Washington State Governor's Office of the Education Ombuds, the City of Seattle's Race and Social Justice Community Roundtable Committee on Racial Disproportionality and Discipline, the Seattle Alliance for Black School Educators, My Brother's Keeper, a White House Initiative event in January, and the um, ERAC, the Equity and Race Advisory Committee to the Superintendent. What you have in front of you, there's an overview of changes. Um, we actually made 854 revisions to the documents you have in front of you. We had cut pages um, from 54 pages down to 39 pages as a recommendation out of last year as well. Um, we changed some titles uh, within the table of content to revise the re um, to reflect the revised content. In addition, we added some commitments um, from Seattle Public Schools that we heard from all of our engagement that we did regarding discipline situations are complex with underlying factors that we need to take into consideration. We need to also be committed to looking at mitigating and aggravating factors when determining the use of exclusionary practices. Also wanting to understand the impact that we actually do have on students when we do use exclusionary practices. And also that disciplinary responses should be least disruptive to the student and school relationship. In addition, we simplified the definitions, again, recommendation that came from last year, and we removed a lot of the labeling and coding just to make it a strict alphabetized uh, list of student behaviors as well. We simplified some definitions, um, and we revised and mirrored some appeal language as well to make it more easily um, readable for community and parents as well. I also do want to respond to some of the director's comments from last week when we met at the policy committee. So Director Geary, um, we did add for in the table of contents, there was a question about the student behavior. And so we added a piece to tie in a formerly student code of conduct so there wasn't confusion as we're transitioning to kind of using different language. In addition, um, the definition, we had called out uh, positive behavior interventions and supports. And what we did is we really highlighted the definition and put in parens the PBIS, understanding that the common expectations language um, in the interactions we have with families is really what it is, recognizing that that is also PBIS. But we led with the definition first. Um, in addition, we also added under the commitments holding all students to high expectations um, and providing quality and effective instruction as well. 
I also wanted to comment, Director Harris um, had brought up the question about we have some legal RCW language regarding um, the teacher's ability to remove students from class. And we do recognize that that is what the law states and what is teachers are able to do. However, we recognize that we need to help build that skill set and confidence in teachers to be able to use classroom responses and school-based responses to help shape behavior. And um, we're doing that in ways that are more preventative and proactive to hopefully minimize the use of those removals if they need to. And we offer that through professional development, um, through consultations, and also on-site visits with our schools as well. Um, and lastly, I did want to share, um, I wanted to lead, leave before we make some comments. Um, I have some statements due to the late nature of the, are on the agenda item tonight, school leaders were not able to be here, but I has, a couple of them um, send me some summaries and I just wanted to read those to you because they capture it much better than I ever could. So um, from Dr. Chris Thomas and Lori Kazanjian at Martin Luther King Elementary. They state, the Alternatives to Suspension work group led by Aaron Romanek has allowed us to respond effectively to student behaviors that disrupt the learning environment. Aaron has supplemented monthly meetings with ongoing support and deepening our understanding and application of the SPS discipline matrix. Given the student behavior is an expression of needs, Carrie Sievertson, who works in behavioral health, then augments our discipline response by helping us develop a plan that addresses those unmet needs. The result has been a significant decrease in loss of instructional time and a school climate that is shifting away from punishment towards appropriate discipline. From Anita Roberson at Madison Middle School, I'm so happy to be a part of this committee working towards ensuring more equitable discipline processes for our students and families. I learn a lot from my colleagues and from the experience in general. We research other school districts, both in Washington and nationally, and we attempted to create a process that would allow leaders to apply both mitigating and aggravating factors to all situations to ensure we could both individualize and humanize the process. We also attempted to streamline and simplify the process for all. We look forward to your feedback so we can make more improvements. And the last one I have is from Garth Reeves, uh, assistant, actually co-leader, uh, co-principal at West Seattle High School. I've been proud to be a part of the Secondary Administrators Discipline Work Group and the development of the proposed changes before you tonight. This is work that I and the team at West Seattle High School take very seriously and is directly connected to addressing the opportunity and achievement gaps that Dr. Nyland has identified as the issue of our time. These changes before you reflect two very important themes related to our work to close our opportunity gaps. First, they recognize the need for and the power of subjective and professional site and context-based decisions around discipline. They achieve this by identifying ranges of sanctions and the application of mitigating aggravating circumstance, one student at a time with a balance of interest between the individual and the community. Second, they address the need to have these decisions be transparent and collaborative with effective students, families, and the larger community. They achieve this in at least two ways. First, through identification and support of alternatives to suspension. At West Seattle, for instance, we have piloted a restorative approach to behavior this year and reduced our out-of-school suspension and our disproportionality index dramatically. These types of approaches will now be codified and support the district and board direction. Second, they direct the structures and supports that keep the decision-making process transparent and student-focused through mediation, re-entry, and behavioral intervention planning and tracking. This is crucial to making discipline decisions grounded in policy, best practice, and the interests of students and community. I want to thank Aaron Romanek and Pat Sander for convening the team and moving the work forward. Thank you for your support to these needed and strategically aligned revisions. Question. Questions, comments, <laughs> concerns? Director Thank Gary. you so much for your presentation, the thoroughness of the outreach and letting us know what that was and the breadth of it, how um, our comments in committee were heard and addressed before we asked about mm -hmm. them or pointed them out. Um, and just Thank you for all this really good work and I'm so happy that you're reporting back to us how it's being received in our schools. Thank you. Director Blanford. I, I second everything that uh, Director Geary said. I will also add that as I was listening to you present, um, it, I think you very clearly articulated the tension around um, providing clarity to our educators so that they know what, in a particular situation, what is the appropriate course of action, recognizing the context matters and that where consideration of the aggravating and mitigating factors is really critical 
Um, the thing that I struggle with, and I th you, you touched on it a little bit, but my understanding of, of the suspensions and expulsions that a prior board we were working on to try to eliminate was that uh, a lot of those a lot of those discipline actions were driven by uh, educators who did not have very good classroom management techniques. And you talked a little bit about how do we improve mm -hmm. our educators' ability to manage classrooms so that it doesn't escalate to a, a discipline place. And so I appreciate the recognition of the tension between and what do you put first? Do you, do you mandate that we no longer have uh, suspensions mm -hmm. and expulsions and then hope that we can educate our educators to know how to manage classrooms, making the assumption, of course, and I should say this up front, most of our educators are very skilled in both how to manage classrooms and how to do instruction. But for those who aren't, what do you do first? You put the, the cart first and say, we will have no suspensions of our elementary school students, and then we work around professional development to make sure that our educators are skilled in classroom management, or do you do the, the professional development first and change the policy afterwards? It was something I struggled with as someone who was voting on that resolution. Uh, it sounds like good, solid progress has been made so that we have both things, and, and that's gonna be the critical piece. Uh, when I saw the discipline data that we've seen, uh, I was really concerned that we were gonna see an explosion in, um, in things that are not exclusionary, but everything else, because that would be the only way to manage uh, unruly students. And it's been nice to see that that didn't manifest uh, to the degree that many of us expected it to. And so my hope is that w as we continue to refine, it sounds like we did quite a few revisions mm -hmm. in this document, that, um, and particularly as we listen to the feedback that we get from our educators who are on the ground and doing the work, um, that we can produce a document that um, works to the benefit of every educator as well as all the students that are being served by those educators. That's a whole lot of words. I was intending to say it a lot faster than that, but, but thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Superintendent Nylon. Great observation. Um, I think the board uh, did <clears throat> this work really well when they did the moratorium because along with the moratorium and staff recommendation was uh, support. So when you take away suspensions, what do you replace it with? So I don't know a lot about what Highline has done, but they've been more vocal and more out front on uh, the moratorium part. I don't know about the support part, and they've gotten, uh, I think, more pushback, at least, that gets to my level. <laughs> uh, and I think that's a real tribute to the work that uh, Aaron and Pat and others have done. So the board funding uh, provided for uh, some staffing support. Uh, <clears throat> that becomes available to schools uh, to help them figure out what those alternatives are. Um, and then Pat has continued to uh, do what we call inquiry work. It's kind of like, okay, how are we doing? Hmm. So uh, a year plus ago, looked at the rights and responsibilities. So how could we change the tone and tenor of that to at least move in to have better alignment with our EOG work. Uh, second, um, and I won't get this quite right, but found that some principals hadn't had the opportunity to access that document and become familiar with it and use it, so they scheduled regional meetings and provided the opportunity to get the training and said, by the way, uh, sign here for your copy. Um, <laughs> And we're now moving forward uh, with the board's more recent request to say where's, we, I call it a red, yellow, green report, where's our report that shows green schools that have achieved the moratorium, where's the yellow list of schools that are making pretty good progress, and where's the red list of schools that aren't there yet. And I think that we have, I think I heard recently, so oftentimes called an 80-20 list in the 
it's not quite that dramatic, but I think 10 of our elementary schools are responsible for uh, half, approximately, of our suspensions. You heard about uh, John Muir as being one of the examples uh, when we reported on uh, March 8th of how then the team comes in and provides the supports with this, really the tension that uh, Director Blanford was talking about is kind of like, we're here to help you. <laughs> and we're not going away until we have helped you. Uh, so it is that balance of trying to keep that tension between Yes, we will get better, and no, it's not just punitive, and no, it's not just PD. It's trying to find that right mix that says, uh, we can do this, we must do this, it's the right thing to do for our kids, and it's hard work. So Aaron and Pat and David and many others uh, are doing good work in helping us figure out, school by school sometimes, what we can do as a better alternative. Thank you. Last up, quick comments. Have you all thought about listing your partners that helped you get here on the back cover or on the front cover to call them out to say thank you? Because this, to me, is something that we should be extraordinarily proud of. And, and if we have that good a group that you named off, I, I would like to see that printed up with a big old thank you. I definitely know some of them were embarrassed that I was going to be calling them out here, but I said you don't have a choice because you put the time and the effort into the work. So that's a great idea. Thank you. And we need to celebrate our successes and our partnerships. Thank, Thank you. you very yep. much. Thank you. Next up, number eight, University of Washington Experimental Education Unit in Brenz. EEU. Yes. Michaela Clancy. Enter, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, let me Whoops. finish the sentence. <laughs> so sorry, it's late. <laughs> Isn't it, though? <laughs> Interagency agreement to provide education services to special education students ages 3 through 6. This went through CNI on May 8th. Director Geary, for consideration. Thank you. The floor is yours. Now it's my yes, turn. Um, I just want to note that Principal Matsumoto and um, Dr. Schwartz are here with us this evening. Um, this has been a very collaborative process with the EEU, and we appreciate that collaborative process. Um, so this is our annual interagency agreement. It um, is actually three interagency agreements combined. One is to serve our kindergarten students at the Experimental Education Unit, and um, the other is our 48 preschool students, half of them who may receive extended day services. And then also, the very exciting, now two years old, um, a year in, two years planning here um, around our technical assistance that comes from their, um, the, from the EEU that's increasing our inclusion strategies in our early elementaries. Um, right now we have three of those um, building sites. We expect to expand those to three more with the increases to this part of the contract. So. Questions, comments, concerns? Director Geary. Just always want to express my thankfulness that we are still in a partnership with the EEU yes. and that um, it is a, a relationship of collaboration. Um, and I wanted to thank Michaela Clancy um, in speaking with Eileen Schwartz. She certainly made it clear that the tenor of the relationship is so different and she had nothing but appreciation for the work that you brought to this. So thank you so much and I look forward to us expanding this and then hopefully taking these techniques and rolling them up through our schools beyond preschool, kindergarten um, and just changing the face of our public education here in Seattle. So thank you everyone. Other questions, comments, concerns? Director Patu. I also would like to say thank you for, it's been a long time, um, this negotiation and, and partnership, and really it's made quite a difference. So thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you. It's been very exciting this year to watch the response of our educators, and I just want to call out um, Beth Carter, who's our early learning supervisor, who's been really a part of that change in our practice with, in collaboration with EEU. We had 100% attendance from our educators in those trainings. So that shows you where we are. Did you want? Director Pinkham, please. 
Yeah, again, thank you for uh, what you've done. My daughter did go to the EU when she was younger. I just brought her home from college uh, <laughs> for the summer. Uh, do we know what three to five schools we're looking at? Um, I, we had a feeling you would ask us this, and we've <laughs> highlighted, because the requests from committee were to highlight the criterion, and so we've done that in those changes from committee, and also how um, the sites were selected. We're still in process. We don't have year-end data. That will be a collaborative process with um, the EEU team as well. We did highlight how what our expansion plan is in the bar. That was also a request from committee. Um, this is a train-the-trainer model which has been very successful in the, um, with the EU previously and so far this year. So we don't know yet. Um, we're going to look at our data, but the criterion are there in the bar. Yeah. Last up, um, what a difference a year makes. <coughs> Holy smokes. This is, this is a beautiful thing to see. Um, no several children there now, and you have saved their lives, and you have saved the lives of their families. And thank you for that. Um, Let's make sure we pay special attention to placement and the criteria for, and, and remember that a year ago we worked really hard, really collaboratively on placement uh, policy, and we still have a hot button issue with respect to placement of our special ed programs, and, and we need to be very cognizant of that. And, and hopefully you can work with Gary's team and, and work on the community engagement piece so that so that we can continue to celebrate the wins and we can get more and faster. Thank you very night, very much. Good night. Thank you. Okay. Oh, it's the second. Number nine, you're up. Contract approval for early support for infants and toddlers, birth to three intervention service providers. This came before audit and finance, May 11th for approval. Last item on the agenda. Be quick. So since 2009, districts have been required to participate in our early intervention services for our birth to three students. Um, last year, we um, conducted a public RFQ. This is an extension of that RFQ. These are the providers, and EEU happens to be one of them, um, that have responded to that RFQ. These are extensions. Um, and the contract has increased because our students have increased significantly, so um, especially through Boyer services. So that's exciting. That shows the overall increase in our population, but also that we're getting to more students for early intervention in our partnership with the Birth to Three agencies. Questions, comments, concerns from my colleagues? Good night. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned at 9.20 p.m. <laughs>